When I think of my wife, I always think of her head, the shape of it to begin with. The very first time I saw her, it was the back of the head I saw, and there was something lovely about it, the angles of it, like a shiny, hard corn kernel or a riverbed fossil. She had what the Victorians would call a finely shaped head. You could imagine the skull quite easily. I'd know her head anywhere. That is the opening passage of Gone Girl, a book by Gillian Flynn, a riveting thriller uh, that uh, comes at a terrible crime-style event from two very different but weirdly complementary angles. Uh, I'm Jason Squamata. This is Book Circle Online, and uh, this is the Gone Girl edition. From the library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Okay, so here we are. Uh, I'm Jason Scumato. Welcome to Book Circle. I am here, as always, with my ravishing co-hosts. Pat Janowski. Mark Savage. Christy Lovato. And, uh, and we are here covering a marvelous, ripping thriller of a book that I just love to pieces. Soon uh, to be made into a major motion picture. Soon to be made into a major, m- a major motion picture, but um, a, a, uh, an adventure of the senses in its own right, even in its book form, Absolutely. entitled Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. Um, uh, I loved it. Uh, what are some general thoughts that we all might have on this book, Pat? This was a diverting mystery. It, little things about it cropped up to annoy me from time to time. We'll get into those later. Mm-hmm. However, once I hit the halfway point of this book, I could not put it down. Mm. I stayed up till 3 in the morning reading this book. Um, or was that the last book I read? Uh, it was, <laughs> let me start that again. Uh-huh. Was it? I can't remember. <laughs> well, no, I, I remember when we spoke of this book as you were in the process of reading it. I that said was, that. So yeah. I stayed up in the, until three in the morning, two nights in a row to finish this book because I was just completely riveted. Um, that's where I'll start. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Mark? Yeah, I enjoyed it. I felt kind of see me. Hmm. I feel the... Do you feel dirty? It's kind of a suburban scene, not a glamorous uh-huh, scene. A kind right. of desperate, um, um, kind of stuck in a in a in a relationship with someone who isn't the person you thought they were. Mm. See me, that kind of right. You can't have enough showers to wash that away. So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah. But you, I mean, we could consider that a a measured and considered aesthetic effect. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah for real. Um, interesting, Christy. Um, I did not like this book. I loved this book, but I did not like it. It was like a really pretty place that I just wanted to get out of as quickly as possible. And actually, I want to wrap this up as quick as we can so I can go check my husband's cell phone messages. Um, Which cell phone? All of them. Oh, all of them. All of them. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, it was, these were two of the most horrible people that I've ever met. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you're the husband and the wife. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So Nick and Amy. Right. Nick and Amy. Yeah. So this uh, this book is, um, I mean, ostensibly initially about uh, this this couple, this uh, charming, um, but I think from the get go kind of creepy couple, um, Nick and Amy. Amy has disappeared from their lovely suburban Missouri home. Under mysterious circumstances. Under mysterious circumstances. And we are clued into this. uh, It it opens with Nick's narration, which begins on the day of her disappearance. And uh, and I think in kind of an ingenious way, um, she's framing his experience so that, I mean, we, we go a ways into his story without really knowing how involved he is in her disappearance. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, he sort of narrates it dispassionately and does not appear to have knowledge of what went on. Right, right. And, uh, and then when it cuts, the, you know, the, the chapters are interspersed between Nick in present time and um, and Amy's diary, his lovely wife and her sweet, 
diary were recounting the, the moments of their relationship leading up to whatever terrible thing happened. Mm -hmm. And in both of those narratives, you can tell that there's something seriously wrong with each of them. Uh -huh. He is off kilter in some way and guilty of something and it does not help that he is constantly fantasizing about his wife's head and her crawling across the floor. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know if this is a memory. As we right. learn more about the dynamics of their relationship, right. it becomes, you know, um, not more obvious, uh, but, you know, more possible that this is just a, a fantasy that he nourishes to get uh -huh. through the day. Uh -huh. Sort of nourishes. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's beautifully drawn in that, I, I agree with you, Christy, I, I hated that first half. I was, it made me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in long-term relationships before, and um, I know that shocks you. And What's that like? I'll never say. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it like this? Was it just like this? Because this is how I imagine it would uh -huh. be. Here's the thing. There were some very typical relationship issues uh -huh. that were addressed very true to life -ly. Um, except for with a missing and or dead wife. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like if he killed his wife, this is all horrible. If something else happened, it's horrible still. If it's just, there's some really ugly descriptions of, um, very, very specific descriptions of the ugly feelings and the mm -hmm. ugly ways people can react to them and the things that can happen in a relationship despite what may appear to be everybody's best efforts. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we have an unreliable narrator or two makes this all suspect. But still, mm -hmm. I felt at one point <laughs> I asked my partner, what is your blood type? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to know? Because if, I didn't if know. If it comes up in a and, police investigation. And because it, it came up <laughs> right. in a and police Nick investigation. And no. he doesn't know. And, and the police officer says, you don't know. Yeah. And I'm like to myself, oh, am I supposed to know? Right. I don't know. Is that a sign of guilt that uh -huh. he doesn't know? Right? But then <laughs> I asked, and yeah. my partner did not know his own blood type. I don't oh. even know my blood type, so maybe I killed You don't? Me. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> you killed me. Call the police. Well, That's, I'm glad you said unreliable uh -huh. narrator or two, because Amy's diary is so uh, uh, wrong. Oh. And... Right. Okay, without, well, what I what I love about it, it's I mean, in contrast to the kind of creeping evil of Nick's perspective, mm -hmm. where you know, I mean, I, I just I love how that sort of first chapter we're buying him is that he's clearly like kind of emotionally inert and has a very curious detachment from from what's happening or what's coming to light, but. You know, we're still, you know, I'm still buying him as a, as a normal, quote unquote, normal person. But then when it gets to the end of that chapter and he says, and that was the fifth lie I told the police. Yeah. <laughs> and you're just right. like, oh, God, you uh -huh. want to go back and look, but you don't want to go back and look because it's so distasteful. Yeah. yeah. And he's so evasive, even in terms of his own internal dialogue, that it almost keeps like, like it, it convincingly cuts away from, you know, like right on the brink of revelation, even mm -hmm. if he's just talking to himself. Well, you don't know if he's hiding things from himself. Right. Right. Even yeah. Whereas in similarly in her diary, I mean, it cuts to this kind of like romantic Pollyanna, you know, version of an earlier stage in the relationship. They started out. So they started out in New York. Right. Uh, literary type people. She is the daughter of these two. We come to find out crazy people, but they're, uh, they are, appear to be or Mr. Are and Mrs. They? Or, are or are they? they? Well, yeah. Well, well, because her testimony has it that they're crazy. Do well, we believe her testimony? Less and less. Well, I believed mm. that her mom had all those miscarriages. Yeah, sure. And that yeah. they does, were all does named that make Hope. you crazy? Uh -huh. Okay, so maybe not crazy, but I've known people... Boy, it seems my life is starting to sound really <laughs> suspect right now. <laughs> Are you dead right now? <laughs> You'll never know. Oh. I've known people who, when they um, suffer from severe uh, infertility, really seem to go off the deep end. And I'm not criticizing these people, and I've been through a little bit of that, but not to the extent that her mother uh, allegedly was in this book. But I can totally picture that happening, and I sympathize with it. However... I can also see how that sort of family circumstance might really fuck up this kid. Well, well and it goes... Go oh, no, go ahead. Please. So it go. I mean, it goes deeper than that. I mean, because 
so so Amy's mother suffers a series of miscarriages, seven miscarriages, and she's the eighth pregnancy, and she lives. And her and ent- their entire life, r- their livelihood, they write children's books based on her as a character. Their entire life, amazing Amy, amazing Amy, um, revolves around her. So you see but not how her right, but a construct of. How they want her to be. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Like and whenever she, she makes a decision they don't approve of, the fictional version of her enshrined in these books um, makes the opposite decision. Oh, it's so horrible. <laughs> so passive aggressive. And that's what I mean by crazy people. <laughs> right. It's like you, honey, you be however you want to be. But our perfect Amy would do this. Our Which has nothing to do Amy. with the Amy. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I uh-huh. love how uh-huh. when we get beyond diary Amy to, to actual Amy. Mm-hmm. Crazy bitch, Amy. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love that description of her seven her seven angel sisters who never had a chance to get anything wrong. And how can she live up to that? Uh, <laughs> how can she live up <laughs> to her mother's the miscarried children? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, and but even before it gets to that point, I think there's this interesting dynamic as we learn that these diaries with her rhapsodic romantic vision of her relationship with Nick are written for a very specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And so they're almost, they're written to the police and in a way written to Nick. And there's this amazing, as you're reading them, you're feeling this growing sympathy for her as it becomes Mm -hmm. apparent that something terrible has happened. But also I'm hearing Nick's voice in my head, like imagining him reading them. And finding her like infuriatingly stupid for um, for for her inability to uh, to to see how how menacing he is, like and he, that turns out not to be the actual the actual Nick. But there was a stage. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Like there was like I was when I you was, weren't sure whether he murdered her or not. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I was identifying with um, her <laughs> idealism and the tragedy of her hopes that would be so violently thwarted, and also. Um, I was identifying with his rage that would make such a thing, you know, happen. Like, I, I'd like t- t- two people who are just so obviously estranged from each other and projecting things on each other. Yeah. In a way, I saw a parallel between Amy's diary and her parents' amazing Amy books yeah. because there was oh, definitely oh, like a, yeah. like everything that Nick <laughs> did in uh-huh. diaries that a normal woman would be like, we need to talk. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's like, I'm not going to be one of those girls who gets mad at her husband right. because he doesn't meet her at the bar when he says he's going to. Uh-uh. Those silly monkeys. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I, I can't believe that any police officer would have fallen for that. Well, but a police officer is in as she like kind of indicts the, the male of the species like later on when she's describing her um, her strategy that. uh it's um, she's she's pretending to be a very uh, particular type of girl, this cool girl that um, that in her view every man is hungering for. So even the right. police and which, reading these diaries, how could you hurt this poor perfect woman? Who's who's <laughs> this <laughs> complete cool girl? <laughs> right, she's nothing like my wife. How I, could yeah. you have done? This? She gave you everything. <laughs> right, and nobody nobody recognizes that uh-huh. that that cool girl is a fiction. Right, that. Does every man want that, really? Uh-huh. She has such hostility towards men in general, and him in particular, right. that uh, you mistrust that whole idea. Yeah, that. well, you feel like she assesses him accurately, like the way he throws himself into the affair, the Andy relationship, this unchallenging right. mm-hmm. sort of, you know, girl who's... Actual much more, cool girl. An actual, well, or someone who's like much more, with more authenticity and vim yeah. and vigor, performing, you know, the cool girl, because that's what you do without this kind of, you know, yammering sociopath behind her eyes, you know, like right. mm-hmm. reinforcing the mask. But, uh, you know, like... But if Amy's vision of the um, like the archetypal male is Nick, um, and uh, and presumably Nick's version of the archetypal desirable female is the cool girl, then they're both they're both insane. Right, right, and that's a lot. Yeah. A, to me, a lot of the story was like two sociopaths <laughs> fall in love, right, and they accidentally meet at that moment where they're both being the golden boy and the mm-hmm. golden girl, right. where you rein in your victim. Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. and is, it turns out they're both sociopaths, and um, it turns out they're both right, and it ends that way. Which yeah, is so but they are. But that's what's interesting is her her critique of his behavior is completely. It's true. Yeah, and uh, and yet, I mean. He he is completely flawed, but not in ways which are 
um, completely unacceptable. Well, and the, and the thing is, her critique of his behavior is true. However, we don't know at this point that she is a sociopath and that she has put on the persona with which she has attracted him mm -hmm. um, deliberately and held it up for a couple years and then changed after they got married. And so he's frustrated. He's like, who is this person? You're not the person I married. Right. And she literally is not because she was pretending. Right. But in her view, he did the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. And and he and he did do the same thing right. because with, with he, he said – Deliberate exactly. effort. He, you know, he said I would spend two hours crafting an email to her. We all right. do those things yeah. at the beginning, but we don't do what Amy does, right. right? And and so I think he's a little less detestable or crazy than she is. Well, well what I, makes it hard with her is when you realize the extent of her lies, mm -hmm. when you realize the extent of her performance and how long she's been planning things. It becomes impossible to believe anything she's telling us. Right, right. Um, which is where. I I had problems with the second half of the book because up until a certain point, it feels like a conflict, two people who you have some sympathy for, perhaps in different ways, struggling to try and make something work that isn't perfect, but retain some idea that it is. Right. Uh, it gets to the point where you realize that's not what she's doing at all. She's doing something far bigger, far more sinister, far more... Hyperbolic and yeah. crime fiction. -y. And then you can't believe anything she says. Yeah. At which point, um, the hard thing with unreliable narrators is you get to the point where you think, well, why should I care what you're saying to me? Right, because if it's just going to get flipped in the Yeah, and everything chapter. you say yeah. is random, and I don't know. And right. you're, f you're capable of far more sinister things than I even thought. Right, right. Well, that I, I had a similar, I mean, I you know, I, I loved it to the end. Um, you know, it, it accrued like a different kind of entertainment value than what I was anticipating. Yeah, too. But there was, there was a quality to the first half of it that I, I missed when it went away. There mm -hmm. was... A spookiness because yeah. Yeah. it was about we were getting more and more intimate with these deranged characters. Well, and, and he was falling back in love with her. Yeah, yeah, and we were her her horrible plot, whatever, was uh, working. Right. He, yeah. He, but you realize I can't trust the Amy of that half of the book. So right. then, can I trust this this carefully nuanced observation yeah. of a relationship? At what point? Is any of this true? Well, and then it became this kind of this game of like sting after sting after yeah. sting. Yeah. Like I feel like the second half relied on kind of like cr crime fiction, mm -hmm. like plot mechanics. Yeah. In a way that the first the first half. Well, was, I, I mean, in the first half, I was thinking about their relationship. In the second half, I was thinking about uh, a certain kind of movie. Uh huh. Um, the hand that rocks the cradle. Uh huh. This single white female basic right. instinct. Right. That kind of sure. r r kind of wave of of films in which uh, uh, uh women do incredibly um violent things right and at the same time are kind of presented in the text at, like as woman that there's somehow like vampire monster woman woman I mean, I, you know I, I felt like she felt very real to me up until i mean i loved the reveal of yo i'm not dead and yeah. you know me too. and uh and you know you get a rush from that like you do from any like really carefully plotted like twist, twist. but uh, there was something that was lost. Was anyone that... surprised by her not being dead? No, oh. I wasn't surprised by her not being dead. Um, I, you know, really, the the moment the the first half ended when he's walking up to the to the shed. In my mind, I had tried and tried to kind of bend it into the shape where. Okay, his dad, who's mentioned only sporadically and mm -hmm. who's crazy but keeps escaping and his emotional issues and um, killed her. Mm -hmm. While he was cleaning up the blood, she crawled away, and she's in the shed. Her dead body's in the shed. Mm. That's where I had – I was like, oh, that's what's there. Right. I was glad it wasn't uh -huh. because it's like the book ended halfway through. Uh -huh, I knew right, that yeah, wasn't yeah. going to happen because right. of the size of the book. Yes. Um, but um, – when it goes into that different set, different sort of construct, this this female villain movie, this mm -hmm. for me, it's kind of the classic murder mystery type of thing that mm -hmm. that happened in the second half, and I like that. That's what I was yeah. saying. It was diverting. Sure. The first half was super uncomfortable for me. It felt close to home. It felt like, oh, yeah. this is a relation. This is written by somebody who's been in a relationship right. and who understands how things die, how th how hard it is, how, and it was just, uh. <coughs> and then the second half was kind of like, ooh. 
What's going to happen next? Right, yeah. And however, there are disadvantages to that. Like when he, the unreliable narrative thing, when he decided not to love Andy anymore uh-huh. on the airplane ride. Okay, I don't love her. Right. And that just like, poof, she was out of his life. If if he can turn off his feelings so quickly, yeah. it really undermines our investment yeah. in his story. Right. You know, in well, his... Well, you know, I actually, um, something with her, like the big reveal with her is this, you know, scheming villain and still being alive. Something else that was lost that I liked about him was like the possibility of his supreme evil. Yeah. Like I didn't, mm-hmm. I, I like, I like missed the dread in his sections where like in those first few chapters with him, he's like, I love that where he's first being interrogated by the police and one of the policemen spins the chair around in the interrogation <laughs> room and sits down in it. And he's wondering, is that something that cops have always done or did they see it in a cop do that in a movie and decided it was cool and they've done it ever since. Yeah. Right. And, and he's like, is this, a, and okay, if so, how am I supposed and to, how so am I much, right, so yeah. much of his detachment, uh-huh. which is seen as a sign of guilt. Yeah. Is, is almost this, this postmodernist uh, awareness he has right. of, having seen these movies where the husband is suspected. Right. Which we all have too. Yeah. Well, Which we all have too. he's living in a trope and in a weird way. Completely. Yeah. And he finds himself having, you know, the, 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 the realistic thing to do in that situation is to be completely confused by the cameras and right. to kind of stand there looking blank. Right, right. But, but what, what is seen as a, si- a sign of um, innocence is yeah. to perform. Right. To perform, to, to have tears, to yeah. actually go out there and be the great TV personality, right, right, which right. he can't find himself doing. Yeah. Um, and well, that's where um, I found him most sympathetic. Oh, yeah, and, and fascinating because when he talks about having, you know, he's this working class guy, but he's got this old money face that you just want to punch as soon yeah. as you see him. Hi, he's, hi. He's, he's a young and, Robert Redford. And yeah. his name is really Lance, not Nick. Right, yeah, and, yeah, right. yeah, but he could never, no one can know that's that. That's not Nicky. And you can tell when the, when the public narrative starts to turn against him when they start calling him Lance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the three, right. La- Lance, Nicholas, right. Dunn. Yeah. Right. The three names, the serial but, killer. But, and so having this reflex right, right, where right. if anyone sees his face at rest, they're going to take an instant disliking to him. So being up there in the lights with Amy's parents, like crying copious tears and... He's nervous, so he had, his reflex is the ingratiating smile. smile. No one with this goofy <laughs> smile could ever be like a preppy schmuck that's going to hurt you. But Why would you? But, it makes but him look in like that a context, shark. yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> their re- their uh, reveals are like uh, inverted. So you, you right. start out with Nick being threatening and potentially evil, and it turns yeah. out he's he really is just kind of a schmuck. He's he's a he's an he's an accidental misogynist. He has his father's like uh, fucking bitch, fucking bitch, bitch fucking yeah. bitch going through his head all the time. Even well, though he really wants to rebel against that and not be that. But yeah. all the women around him are manipulative bitches. Yeah. That, Shauna. That right. woman, is that the name of the woman with the selfie? That mm-hmm. like, yeah. went, oh yeah, my yeah. God. But right. he knows it as well. And, and uh, yet he walks into the trap. Yeah. Well, Shauna he doesn't and have then, the well, power to say, leave me alone. Well, yeah. I mean, I think he, I, he, Which I is think it's kind of a feminine thing. It's like women aren't, aren't allowed to say to someone, I'm not interested. Right. You know, so you have to say, I have a boyfriend. Right, yeah, yeah. Only until they are confronted with the fact that there might be another male right. will they leave you alone. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, you just can't say, hey, but I'm also, not interested. But I, also, think, I think there's a point where, where, where he as a man does not have experience of saying no to women. Uh-huh. He doesn't do it. Mm-hmm. As we've seen, he has affairs. He doesn't say no. But also, on, a, on another level, women don't approach men in quite the way that... Um, men approach women, perhaps. So he's used to being the yes man. He he gets what he wants because he he approaches women and says, "I want you," and they they want him right. because he's attractive. And well, he's and I, the I, baby boy. Well, yeah, but I think also like assuming, okay, I look like this, and I said the right thing that the character who's playing me would say in this situation. So I got this. So I guess I want this. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like there's, like, in the same way that there's this kind of, like, shrieking mania in her that mm-hmm. she masks mm-hmm. with these layers of performance, there's just this this emptiness. I mean, Well, it, not necessarily it, empty, but really, really buried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like because what, he does, does he feel want? things. He does right. feel things, but he does, they're not close to the surface. Right. Um, yeah, mo- it mostly comes out as this, like, 
frustrated. He's just exasperated with the whole situation. Like, yeah. this can't be happening to uh, me. This uh, is crazy. Right, really? <laughs> this is like a movie. Uh-huh. What yeah. the hell? Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, yeah, and I, and I think that the constant, this, you know, like what, you know, this is like a movie. What role am I supposed to be playing? What narrative do the police have? And do I play to that or against that? Like all those questions of what kind of story am I in and how should I be behaving seem to indicate just like someone – like I, I've, I've read interviews with the author where she – and the thing that really made me want to read this book was – her espousing her, her – uh, she's a student of Patricia Highsmith, and she uh-huh. loves mm-hmm. Patricia Highsmith. Oh, yeah, yeah. me too. I'm yeah, a big fan. That. Yeah, and so in, um, you know, in, in the Ripley books, <clears throat> you get this portrait of a sociopath whose relationships are very fleeting and opportunistic. We mm-hmm. don't really get to see – I mean, Ripley is married, at, I think, a couple of points in those books, but we don't get to see Ripley in a relationship per se. And for the first – half of the book before the reveal and he became more definitively the victim. There's a similar nobody home. There's this similar oh, so like Nick po- might be Ripley. Yeah. You might by the end think that actually Yeah, that Amy's, Amy's more Ripley. the Ripley character. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Right. And well so post reveal. Yes. Post the black first black page. Right. Uh-huh. Where we, we get to see the true internal dialogue of Amy, not the diary Amy. Uh-huh. Yeah, I can't wait um, till they find my diary. I really started uh-huh. to enjoy that. <laughs> that tr- transition for me was, um, so Amy has chopped off her hair. She gives herself a mousy haircut. She has slowly been putting on, you know, she's gained 15 pounds. She has essentially disarmed all of the qualities that made it easy for her to manipulate people and she has put herself in this world the hideaway the hideaway hotel mm-hmm. in the in the catskills in the, the ozark adirondack Adiro- ozarks, ozarks. Mm-hmm. some of those eastern sad so she's basically mountains. in this yeah she's in this sad sort of like backward hotel where there's lots of runaways and she has no leverage these Especially sad care. and backwards to her. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very right. much from her her moneyed perspective, isn't uh-huh. it? They're they're all kind of desperate and lonely and disgusting people, right? And from she, her perspective, well, and she felt the same it? way about her neighbors in uh-huh. you know right. in, in yeah. Missouri. Yeah. But she's no longer amazing, Amy. Mm-hmm. So there's this huge. Uh, for me, there was a big ju- juxtaposition between Greta and Noel. Greta, the the runaway woman with the bruise, and Noel, you know who who's very quickly becomes the alpha bitch in that situation at the hideaway and Noelle, who was completely beholden to Amy. Right, mm-hmm. for anything. For so everything. she's yes. no longer amazing Amy. She's no longer beautiful. She's no longer, you know, intellectual right. or rich or any of these things. And she has no power. And mm-hmm. she quickly finds out that she has no power. Right. So she gets robbed by these two yokels, oh, essentially. And to me, that was really fun to read all that stuff. The, um... She reveals to the landlady that she needs money, and and landlady says, "Oh, he might hire you to do something or whatever. Right. However, it is that, that he knocks <laughs> on her door in the middle of the night. Come on, there's a fifty in it for you. I'm like, really? You're gonna go with him? And it was it was highly entertaining and unlikely that whole right. scenario, almost mm-hmm. farcical. Yeah. Like she yeah, yeah. has absolutely no mm-hmm. tools to operate." Outside of the limited sphere that she's been in. It, right. And, and it's where you, the cracks in her character appear because at, at certain points she is brilliant. Mm-hmm. And in right. other ways she's very naive. Naive, that, oh. that, that way in particular. Yeah. Uh, and some of my problems with the second part of the book came when you you know you think so i'm supposed to believe she's someone who thought of this a year in advance but she didn't see this thing happening uh-huh. right uh-huh. you didn't right. see that you didn't see that coming yeah. a guy who's stealing catfish and well, finds out you have was... 10 grand in your belt okay yeah. so 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 hold on in her uh, defense because yes. i'm just like her. oh Amy <laughs> um, um really i she... have to go <laughs> uh, i have to go she had home decided with you. she was yes. going to kill herself she wasn't right. going to be living for more than a couple months. So right. $10,000 was plenty. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it was only when her sociopathic brain, for whatever reason, decided, oh, maybe he does love me. Oh, maybe I'll go back. Right. Oh, maybe, you know, that any of that cropped up. So I think uh, it, it's, it, I hear you in mm-hmm. that it's, it's, she's super smart. She's smarter than everyone around her. However, she is mentally ill. And so there's like, well, in moves like that, they kind of they discredit her, like make her less yeah. you know, convincing as the pulp villain. But um, in the, in its ultimate rondelay back to love story, you know, like 
they're just just so fucked up, the two of them. I can't believe <laughs> when she ended up back on his doorstep. I uh-huh. thought that was so awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I the it. change of plans. I know, and in her mind, it's this hero's <laughs> journey, right? So yeah. she has called Desi, the boy, the boy who loved her, who she is. Turns out, is one of many people she has completely destroyed because they have, in some small way, just a little way, they have they have offended her, right, or or treated her in in a way other than that she is the most superior woman on the planet, right. right. So she has she has framed a man for rape. She has framed a teenage girl for stalking. Right. Well, but that's you know, but the, the, she's got this operatic version of the same complexes that Nick has because repeatedly he'll talk about you know, okay, here or she'll like here's this lifelong friend, right? Or, you know, or it's often in her examining his behaviors, but a lifelong friend will just say something out of turn. Stats. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. And we'll. And we'll never hear from that person again. Huh. You huh, know, yeah. like he's just, he's kind of got a hair trigger. Okay, you don't see me the way I want to be seen. Okay, then I don't need you I don't. Anymore. I don't know why I'm so much more forgiving to him. Because oh, yeah, I am a we, man. Well. Is that it? I'm just such a man lover? <laughs> um, um, here's my question. Yes. This is a complete um, tangent. Um, Andy, his affair, mm-hmm. seemed pretty awesome. Yeah. Right. What would have happened? Could they, could the two of them, could Nick and Andy have been happy together if Nick and Amy had just quietly divorced? Well, now even go. So the twin sister, Nick's twin sister says, mm-hmm. yeah. the only reason why you love her is because she sees you the way that you want to be seen in these very limited circumstances, in these very, um, from a distance, only at your best, only when you're the most romantic and it's fleeting and right. And that she would lose interest in him, too, if uh, he were to... That well, makes more sense. Actually, here's my feeling, because I feel like, okay, so he needs, you know, like uh, a partner, the female, to see him in his best possible state. He was intoxicated by the relationship with Amy because the best self that she insisted on was kind of he had to, like, climb up a few rungs to, like, to be that guy on a regular basis. Right. I feel like, you know... Andy, you know, what just liked him being this journalist guy who had Regular come guy. from the big city. Not so much a big... And, but, Andy, yeah. but Andy doesn't see him doing the washing up or, uh-huh. or right. nag him for doing something. Or right. not doing the washing up. Yeah, Either yeah, way, yeah. it's yeah. very much a show up, uh-huh. have a drink, right. tell a story, have sex. Yeah. Um, in, in his world, it's the ideal relationship. Right. Right. In my world, that's the <laughs> <that too. laughs> well, yeah. Then there's all this other stuff. Well, that's another thing. I, you know, I, I think it's kind of beautiful that through the lens of a crime thriller, I mean, I, I feel like in this sort of Patricia Highsmith tradition, it was looking at the things between men and women in the most dispassionate, you know, like lens possible, like through the eye of a sociopath. Mm-hmm. This is the things that these monkeys do to each other <laughs> when they're mating, right? You know, and uh, and so you know, and so uh, you know, occasionally that was disturbing. Occasionally it was, it was like something so true was said that all of the clinging and cherishing of like Amy's parents, you know, mm-hmm. like I mean that you know, in most in most narratives, the way they were, despite you know, evidence surfacing of them being more damaged than they would let on. I mean. They would be seen as as cute. I mean, the you know the lifelong soulmates. Yes. They you know my parents have been in love with each and other. And yet, repeatedly, that is a problem. That yeah. their, their uh-huh. touching seems inappropriate right. yeah. to both her, their right. their daughter and their son. And yes, Nick doesn't want to hook a corner at their house and find them cherishing each other. Right. <laughs> oh, they're both so annoyed at that. right. Their giant, their giant uh-huh. character flaws that they're in a uh-huh. healthy relationship. Their that giant is. love. Right. Right. Yeah. So and and they. I mean, it's great. They are. Um, they seem to be parents who love their daughter, whatever their issues. Right. Um, and they love their son-in-law. They back him until it seems impossible to back him. Right. You can't really fault them, their, you, their demeanor throughout. You can't. I mean, I think the scene where they approach her. And yet, and, they're yes. frequently. Yeah. Um, they're not just well, simpering. No. Lovable people. There's no, something y- about that. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, and they've her got mom a real is suspicious. Edge. Yes. Her dad really wants to believe him. Right. Well, um, and there's the guilt factor of them having 
blown their money and had to take back. No, but, the, but well, that, that is so endearing. Those, I thought that was sweet. <laughs> you yeah. know that that's one of the things that kept popping up for me as maybe this is a red herring uh-huh. because when we found out they were both totally unreliable all the things that each of them said became suspect and so i kept waiting for things i kept mm-hmm. looking you know in the second half where it's right. more like this murder mystery thing uh-huh. oh they didn't actually take her money she has all of her money stuck oh, away in right. the cayman islands right. um uh you know what what is with the credit card purchases <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. things that were le- left hanging right that i just didn't that that weren't tied up as as beautifully as say Patricia Highsmith well, it, it, might have done. It sure. keeps him incriminated, so he doesn't just go to the cops. Right. I suppose, but he. Yeah. Well, I I think what I mean in Patricia Highsmith, I find that there's generally there is often a shocking twist near the end. Yeah, this but shocking twist was in the middle. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> there were, and I felt like there was this like chain of shocking twists like our mm-hmm. appetite for the like flipped script has become like so compulsive and, and the, my problem with that is it eventually that diminishes the impact it diminishes does, yeah. right. if, if you have shocking twists coming too much right um you get to feel like i'm you're being tricked a bit too Oh, much. absolutely. Yeah, because I, I think, like, in the Highsmith context, that twist feels like a climax. And what you feel mostly is not constant surprise, but the grinding inevitability of this character's That's amoral appetite. You should, you should either see it coming or you should go, ah, oh, I should have seen that coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, for me, the, right. the big – because I, I see, like, Amy's sort of journey through the book is, you know, f- first she's this innocent and then you find out she's this kind of – meticulous criminal mastermind and and has ultimate control over every situation but then finding out really she doesn't she has control over nick she has control in these very limited circumstances and she gets into this this series so there's the robbery there's these this series of events where she has completely lost control of the situation and the twist for me was her going back to Nick because – so there's the, the Desi Completely, story. So she yeah. calls mm-hmm. Desi. She ends up – you know, he he has built this shrine for her at the fake Swiss, Swiss chalet on the lakeside. <laughs> uh-huh. That is and just a man-made lake. That is Thank just a man-made much. lake. 2002. <laughs> it is a Swiss-themed uh-huh. McMansion on a man-made lake. Right? It is not – you know, but he has, <laughs> you know, built this beautiful, you know – a aviary filled with tulips and painted the room her favorite color circa 1992. Yeah, and the can paint I just say the the, ir- the irony of 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 Amy being disparaging about um, a fake uh, fake opulence right. is uh, hilarious. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And she right. very quickly she thinks she can manipulate Desi, but she can't. She very quickly learns that she is not in control of that situation, mm-hmm. leading to like the well, big. Well, she takes control. Yeah. Right. She has to take the bull by the horns. As it were, take the champagne bottle, you know, by the the lips. By the lips. (laughs) The lower lips. So she fakes the signs of captivity and repeated rape and torture. Another tangent. Mm. Was anyone else bothered by the use of twine? Um, Yeah, everybody knows that's a terrible ligature. Twine (laughs) as a ligature to to bind her. And it's like, Uh that's too skinny. Uh I just didn't. It, it it pulled me out the story multiple times because twine was brought up about five times. Uh-huh. I'm just going to throw that out there. Okay, fair I'm going to pretend like it I have no input or experience. Was in that, that more of a problem yeah, to you than uh-huh. Nick realizing that he could go on television and wear his the favorite tie that she bought for him and appeal to her and say, I love you, oh, and no. that knowing that, that she would then say, now I can come back. Right. Did that bother you? <clears throat> because I found that whole... The scene. now I could come back part <sighs> surprised me. That, that, he, that he knew what she was thinking, having realized that he knows nothing about what she's thinking, right. to suddenly have such an astute observation, which then here's, actually happens. Here's my question. It's, but it, it, it's with the, um, on the subject of emotions, mm-hmm. right? So... Where she lost control was with Desi and his emotions. Uh-huh. Her own emotions, she didn't know she was going to change her mind about offing herself. Uh-huh. And that threw her whole plan. Uh-huh. Right. He has really buried emotions, but they are there. Uh-huh. Or at least I believe that they're there because I'm a, I'm a man lover, apparently. Mm. Um, and uh, and that, that he there's something, d- there's something to their relationship, which is just... Right, right. Because yeah. ultimately... <clears throat> 
it is a love story. Yeah. And this right. whole thing and everyone involved in this whole thing are just tools that they are using for each other. For each other. And I f- that didn't bother me, Mark, the the mm-hmm. knowing the script. No, nope, either. For to to use the, all of these public appearances and press conferences as a way to woo or trick Amy to come back to him because, in a sense, she gave him all of that tools. ammunition. Right. It's as if Amy wrote this gigantic like if she you know she she did she wrote a list of the ten things that are wrong with their relationship except for she did it in a diary that she left oh. for the police. Right. right. So she's she's forced him into this situation. Right. And he so, knows so, what she wants. But the uh, so then by extension, she knows that he knows. So when she's coming back. She, is she? It, I mean, this is what's interesting at the end to me is her narration seems to she seems to believe that Nick can be changed into the guy that she wants, which is what yeah. I'm talking about with emotions. But, she can't get it. But but yeah, but but what she's managed to do is is put him in a position where he can perform that role, right. but right. it's she, not actually. She doesn't care. She doesn't care. She wants him she? to behave like the man that she married. Yes, knowing. She wants him to know that he has to behave that way or she will be his undoing. Well, but I, and but she I, wants to believe what he's doing. That's what's interesting right. is he can say, and I love you. And she's willing to I believe, believe it. it. Well, I, and I, the other thing is that, sorry, yes, Jason, go ahead. No, please. This, this idea that it is about their relationship from beginning to end. Um, if you spend enough time with someone, you want to believe that there is something significant about this. Yeah. These things have happened. Uh-huh. This must mean something. Right. And at the end of it, I don't think either of them really know what well, they mean to each other, but they want it to mean something, don't they? I mean, he, maybe really he does. There's this beautiful moment that I think summed it all up for me where Amy has come home. <clears throat> she has forced... Nick has to know. She, he has to know how she pulled this off, so she makes him strip down naked and get in the shower. Right, right. Where <clears throat> where she checks, checks him for wires That's and great. whispers <laughs> in his ear the whole story in yeah. the shower. And then it's time for bed, and she wants him to come to bed. And he says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep on the couch. I'm <laughs> not like, coming really? to bed with you. And she says, you know I can still hurt you. Yeah. And to me, that's like she's yeah. saying, pl- play the role. Yeah. Pick up the script, come to bed. I have been in that almost exact position. Um, <gasps> I want to hear uh, more about this. Maybe when the microphone's yeah, off. Yeah, that's a whole other – that's not for book circle. That's for a whole other kind of circle. But um, – <laughs> Yes, uh, and um, there's something in this fractured, gone girl way that is romantic about that. I think they're um, not just her feelings for him, um, but their actual relationship is romantic in the sense that, um, yeah, I I think they, they understand each other's emptiness and how much of their identity is performance mm-hmm. and that they have that in common. So she's saying, I have performed all these roles to get us to this place where, you know, it's like these characters can't exist in a no bullshit zone, but let's choose our bullshit and let's make our bullshit complimentary because I, I know I've seen you perform the kind of man I want you to be. <laughs> so, you know. Wow. Uh, so she, the, the only difference is she understands their bullshit before he does. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, like you said, I, you know, there's, there's probably more, you know, a less well, damaged uh, person inside I want ultimately. to believe that. That's my, that's my thing. I, I hear what you're saying about uh, the romance and the, 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 the core of the story being right. that they end up in this place where they understand they're both empty. Uh, for me, the ending, it just felt icky. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I it, was oh, good. So it's super yeah. icky because it's not, oh. it's not, they're not resolved it, it to, into, like, they understand they're each other's strategies. People. No, and the paranoia is never going to go away. I and can so, still hurt you. But I'm yeah. imagining right. a lifelong relationship that's almost the anti-matter opposite of her parents' relationship, mm-hmm. where rather than this mm-hmm. constant, cha- there's this constant performance of understanding like explosions of like erotic hunger and then apathy and with their two competing memoirs about the event like trying to consume each other constantly Which is what i mean you know th- that's and relationships could get to that point where no this is how we are no this is how we are right yeah and i i've i'm collecting evidence so that the police can confirm that this is how we are no 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 i have this evidence and so i will bring so that the police can uh, so that the yeah. media can <laughs> right. confirm that this is how we are and right. this is what the book is is yeah. essentially two competing narratives uh uh-huh. yeah. right the vomit in the back the vomit in the back of the freezer that that she has saved for like Oh, two years. And yeah, when he the finds poisoning. it, yeah. right, 
when he finds that he's mad because because he finally realized he knew that it was hidden somewhere, but he realized what a dig it was that she put it in the back of the freezer. Oh, Nick never cleans out the freezer. Yep, <laughs> and so he cleans and it he, out and he leaves, leaves the jar. And, and, right. and, and, those, and she those, doesn't care. She's uh, like, "Yep, he got me there." Those uh, tiny observations of, <coughs> excuse me, of. <coughs> <coughs> The ways in which tiny gestures domestically can be seen like that. Yeah. You could leave something out. Like, well, were you trying to tell me something by leaving that out? Uh-huh. Right. Oh, no, dear. I just cleaned it up. I right. just happened to leave it there after I cleaned it. Right. But you could have put it away, but you were leaving me a message. Uh-huh. That oh, you no. cleaned it. I, just, I, wasn't, yeah. I had a million things on my mind that day. That was yeah. just one of them. Right. The way in so which I, they well, spiraling back down oh, yeah. into this tiny... You don't understand the consequences of yeah. your actions. Mm-hmm. And, right. uh, so it, it's, uh, it's like this... This domestic situation, I, it's just, it's a relationship As book that explodes. As it starts explodes. out and then yeah. ends. That's interesting. Yeah. I kind of want to read it again with that perspective. Right. It like explodes into like pulp frenzy and yeah. then contracts again into that domestic into that dread. Yeah. Um, snip and snap and pick, 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 right. pick, pick. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I feel like once the twists settle down, I mean, what we're left with is just a, like a really ugly relationship. Yeah. And to me, it would never end. A forgiving reading of, of, the, of that <laughs> middle to the, uh, the second half of uh, the book is that um, a lot of the characters, the lawyer, the cops become kind of stereotypes. Uh-huh. But it, it's through the, uh, if you know, it's through the eyes of the two characters. Uh-huh. So they're seeing them. They ca- they're kind of casting them as, you know, oh, you're the sympathetic cop. You're the cop who doesn't care. Uh-huh. Um, right. Right. Oh, and the lawyer. I love you're that the, the lawyer is like... You're the shark. The, the, the shark lawyer who represents men who obviously killed their wives. Yeah. And he starts out as this douchebag <laughs> archetype. But it turns out he's just... He's really in love with his wife. Mm-hmm. He's he really the likes most, Clamato. Yeah, uh-huh. he's you know? the most human like <laughs> character. <laughs> he but so. how even even the Clamato has seen this an affectation. Uh, uh, yeah. point. Maybe right. maybe this is what he does to yeah. suggest some kind of character. Right. And he's yeah. like, yeah. there's his quirk. Kind of Clamato. Almost uh, by the end, you you see the disdain that the lawyer has for Nick, yeah. and you're yeah. like, whoa. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you're the two most fucked up people I've ever met in my exactly. entire life. And and I I've met specialize. a lot of <laughs> yeah. fucked up people. I loved, I loved that. Uh-huh. Yeah. I did. It, yeah. Um, there was a lot to love about this book in that way. Um, uh, uh, God, I mean, the 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 fact that the the relationship issues were so relatable yeah. to anyone who's been in a long-term relationship that um oh, it's so many of the things well and and the portrait that it paints like it's presenting you know it's ordinary suburban world um ordinary yes well but yeah but there is not a single character that felt like an extra to me it, fe- it felt like every mm-hmm. character was some kind of refraction of their dysfunction. It felt like, you know. That's interesting. Noel and, yeah. 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 The thing that fell flat for me where it lost me was I did not, I did not believe that the FBI would not be on to her because the interview, she's giving this interview and it's so... Yeah. Oh, she's terrible in the interview. She's terrible in the interview and there's <laughs> so many because holes Because she's explaining the story, the story right. with such detail. Right. It, it just suggests that there's I, more to come. She's congratulating herself through the entire police interrogation. Uh-huh. You probably missed this detail, but here's right. what I think right. probably happened. Well, yeah. right. As right. I was beaten Pro- up and bleeding and on the floor, this is what happened. I you kept waiting this, but, for them yeah. to stumble on her Ozark Mountain cabin and find those people as witnesses. I really, like, yeah. why didn't they find She said, oh, they'll never find me here. I'm like, yes, they will. Right. You know, draw a line of how far you can go, and I don't know. Yeah, maybe I watch too many police well, procedurals. Well, no, but so but so many of the characters in this book watch too many police procedurals, yeah. and right. it'd be it, wise it, to that. It's, it's, it's the great constantly. defense of the book, and it might yeah. be one of the flaws of the book that right. it relies on that idea so much that every time something seems a bit hokey, yeah. someone says this might be like a TV. bit hokey. Yeah. Um, and and it, it it's one of the lovable defenses. It's also one of the right. damning criticisms right. for me. Yeah, uh, both at the same time. Indeed, because right up to a point, it's like there's you know until she there is a dead man here. There's a man who is dead. Oh, that was so awesome! Uh-huh. <laughs> I love that part of the book. I'm uh-huh. sorry. Yeah. Okay, That's so a little Jesse, too hysterical. Okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> dead man. Okay, so here's dead. the thing. He, uh, she, cons- Amy constructed the myth partly about Desi. Uh-huh. I mean, he was enamored, besotted, 
uh, stalking her, but he didn't try to kill himself with the pills. She constructed that part. Right. Uh, but then he did. It was intriguing when uh, then he did prove himself to be somewhat of a monster. Uh huh. Now, did she well, create that? But I, I don't even think he was that is, much of a monster. Was he? Was he? I mean, the other thing really? is keeping her. Pr- I mean, well, you got to remember, Pat. We're being told this by her, right? Uh, so if we if we believe everything she's telling us in the second point, half of the book, when she's describing the paint, the room was not the paint was not fresh. Right. He said the the tulips would bloom all year. I believed that. Sure. Well, um, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. But I, but I, I think by th- by that point we've come to understand her as a bit of a monster herself. Yeah. So I, you know, it to me it like changed their relationship in that, like Desi is like a vampire who like what is it? He's not he's not necessarily attracted to this golden girl that he knew. It's like he, he needs something. Well, yeah. I mean, he he needs her. He seems almost you know, despite this wanting to keep this kind of like virginal ambiance or of who they were way back when is perhaps you know um see someone as as twisted and as uh, as he is yeah. maybe he built the chateau when he thought they were going to get married they were in a relationship for <laughs> right? quite some time but and you know just preserved think it. about it from desi's perspective i'm trying <laughs> she is effectively dead she cannot leave because he's she'll got be found her. out under he's his got her, but he never. Well, she gets, but she also gets what she wants: a safe place to be, yeah, protected, kind of, where she can watch. And and the and what she, where does she want to go? What does she need at that point? She needs. She did want she to needs get everything. out though, because he annoys her. Well, right. He, she so, wanted to so get out she kills him. <laughs> uh-huh. I know. Isn't See, it awesome? Well, that's what. Well, <laughs> Nick, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, poor pathetic Desi. Oh, Nick was well, Nick no, was, was in the horrible. same position as she was. Right. In a way. Okay. Well, mean, but. Desi never forced himself on her no. until she decided that it was useful for her. He to never have sex would. With him. Right. And he never would. <laughs> I, I don't I, think he he's would. heterosexual. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I think Desi is a vampire. I think, I think he's... Desi's in love with his mother. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, that's oh, most, right. Yeah. They Do you know who's going to play him in the movie? <gasps> oh, Steven Seagal. <gasps> no, 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 at last. Shut up. He's back. Is he alive? <laughs> who's going to play him in the movie? More, no, Patrick more than Harris. us. Oh. Say that again. <gasps> okay, all right. Well, Neil Patrick Harris. First, just so you know, Book Circle listeners, there is a film in development. There it is. It's all shot. It's coming out, right? David Fincher. David Fincher is Who directing. Shot seven. Seven mm-hmm. and Fight Club and oh. Zodiac and so many lovely. Oh, it's going to be beautiful. Is so, Brad Pitt in this movie? Because isn't every movie. Ben he... Affleck is playing Nick. Um, oh. And I, but which I think is Ooh, perfect nice because sleaze factor. Well, yes, I generally um, he's I, handsome, I, but yeah. he's handsome and vacuous in so many films where I've like the camera lingers on him, especially films that he's directing, where the camera, <laughs> oh. the camera lingers on him and there's silence, and we're supposed to be watching an actor emote. I see just the sheen of narcissism, and he's like, con- like contemplating the he, geometry of his Jason. own perfect. He jaw. moves his jaw. Yeah, he, he, he kind of uh, right. He does. It's a jaw. Thing. This is what a man would do with right. his jaw when yeah. having a when, feeling. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and I think that's perfect for for Nick, who is who is constantly yeah. interrogating his uh, his his own behaviors, trying to sell himself. As, I okay. As so human. let's go back for a second. Yes. Okay. So Nick. Is also a sociopath or a deeply flawed, empty, vacuous human who deserves to be in a relationship with Amy. Well, what about well, d- deserves impl- implies a moral order to the universe that I don't think the book mm-hmm. supports. But I agree, okay. and I don't. I don't think there's a moral order. They to bring the out the best in each other. Okay, <laughs> so they bring out the best in each other. What uh, of then? Yes. My favorite character in the book. Yes. His sister, Go. Oh, yeah. Go's great. Who is, she's the stalwart. She's the, the, the lantern in the wilderness. Right. She is the one whose word you can totally believe. Right. All throughout. She's no bullshit. She loves him. Yeah. She's his twin. Is she like his soul or something? Did she come out of the inside of him and left him an empty shell and she's like the real one? Or what's going on here? Because yeah. she really cares about him and he really appears to care about her. Well, yeah. And that's his first moment. I love that his first moment of real rage and his internal dialogue is when go yeah. for a brief second believes he might have done it yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and then when she is brought in for questioning yeah he gets angry yeah yeah i think that well there's a suggestion that their relationship as twins is, is special in a way that no other relationship can be 
Right. Which twin relationship? Well, which he addresses very early on when he says yeah. people used to think we had a right. I thought that was something that that was really off for me that he had to first he had to state that, uh-huh. and then he had to say unequivocally in his own internal dialogue. We did not I never ever fucked my sister. I thought yeah. that was him telling us he's attracted to her uh-huh. because oh, I don't I think that you would necessarily bring it up unless. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and I think that that argument that she is in a sense his soul that has some weight because like his, you know, if we if our partner is, you know, at least theoretically the soulmate, I mean, Amy just augments the worst parts of his character, whereas Go is sort of is a consolidation of all the pieces that he's missing. She's very authentic. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Which is a problem for Amy. Yeah. And their relationship. Right, yes. Which I liked. Yeah. Why are all these real people doing around here? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because Go never quite buys Amy. Right. She never buys into the Amy myth. And who's playing Go in the movie? Somebody we don't know. Well, who's playing Amy? In English? Uh, Amy, Rosamund Pike. Oh, I don't know her. Rosamund Pike. I okay. know the name. Wait, so who's playing Desi? Neil Patrick <laughs> Harris. Oh, Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> Doogie Howser fan. Are you being funny? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> You're just being forgetful. What? What? <laughs> Where so, am I? Um, Tyler, Tyler Perry is the lawyer. No. Oh, really? yeah. As <laughs> Medea? <laughs> <laughs> that plays the great. wife as well. Yeah, nice. Let's That's, just uh, you know, and I thought that fourth wall. Uh, that's uh, odd to me because I think part of the thing was that they were an interracial couple, and that's uh-huh. part of the no, Excuse no, me. the lawyer and his wife. Oh, right. That that was so unexpected for Nick that it throws him. Well, maybe his for wife a is loop. white. Maybe, mm. maybe it's not. Uh, inversions all the way down, mm-hmm. all the way down. Um, and uh, oh, and, uh, and I just uh, I, and I, I remembered it just popped into my head. This is a point we were making hours ago. But uh, but in terms of everyone putting on airs, everyone assuming fictitious identities, uh, there's also that woman who wanted to be um, Amy's best friend. Oh, Noel. Noel, yeah. Uh, no, but, uh, no. But, the, but the woman earlier at, that at she was college. a menace. Uh, yes. That oh, was, oh, the one who um, – Susie. Who, who wants quotes, to be Susie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She wanted to be not like her best – the best Amy's well, best friend in the book. So that's what we so thought. One, well, we thought she was pretending to be – Right. Her best friend and then pretending to be Amy, but she was actually Amy was actually making a pretend to pretend <laughs> to want that. Right. It was all this elaborate ploy to get back at Amy's parents, so Amy said she was she made her, her act batshit crazy. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. To to annoy her parents, yeah. Because damn. this is where it was all kind of Perry Mason. Uh huh. Right. It was I you, know, you could see her part. on the stand. I you loved could see when her. the when sure. the when the boyfriend, the ex that she had accused of, of rape, said, oh, I was expecting you to call, kind of thing. You know, right. it's like, right. oh, my God. I should have warned. She's warned got you. you, man. <laughs> oh, <my God>. I <laughs> oh, feel yeah. bad for you. Yeah. I first heard it on the news, and right. I thought, oh, <coughs> man, he's in for it now. Um, she's been accused, Gillian Flynn, yes. of misogyny. because Jason frequently... brought this up earlier. Right. Yes. Well, no, he didn't. Okay. Let's, but, like, wh- okay, what, what do we think about that? Like, Women. Right. Here. Yes. Ladies, what do you think of that? Don't is, call me a lady. Is is writing a book or maybe several books where a woman might be behaving far more terribly than any man present? Is that is that misogyny? Bullshit. Well, I think it's very telling that the entire first half of the book, Amy is a very wonderful girl who's incapable of doing anything to harm anyone. She takes care of her dying mother-in-law and she don't. She drives the women to the blood bank to donate blood even though she's terribly afraid of blood. And the whole time we're thinking, this is bullshit. Uh-huh. This is not a real person. Right. So even when Amy is, is, is posing herself as this perfect woman, there is an overarching sense of dread in there because it can't... It can't be true. So is that a criticism of, uh, is, uh, is the author st- almost telling us that, that there's an expectation of the way women are to be, which is just ridiculous. In fiction. And, well, I mean, and that Amy is aware of this. But we don't, we don't read fiction to hear about the way people, the way people are all the time, the no. things they do. We, we want to hear people at their most extreme and we I want to see them do things agreed. that. Right. I agree. I agree agreed. Agreed. with that completely. And I, and it makes the stakes higher. It makes us want to continue reading. Well, uh-huh. Margaret Atwood wrote a great evil female protagonist. Shoot. What was the name of the book? 
X, Y, there's an X or a Y in it. I'm going to look it up. Um, okay. Where the, the women in the book are imagining Xenia or something, uh. that this woman is preying on all their husbands and she's writing them these notes and all the husbands are are oblivious and they're falling for her. And it turns out in the end, all the guys are like, her? Yeah. What? Uh-huh. And all the women are... And nobody says to Margaret Atwood, <laughs> you're a misogynist. You know, right. it's human behavior mm-hmm. all around. Uh-huh. Men write about evil men characters constantly. Yeah. yeah. It's, to me, that's a non-issue. Yeah. Well, Good. I think fellas... Good. Uh-huh. Good. Are women capable of evil? Uh, I, ho- I hope so. <laughs> I really do. I really hope so. Uh huh. Yeah. I, there's no doubt in my mind. I, I could you show you the so, bruises. You hope so, but you don't know. I could show you the bruises. I think I. Uh, yeah. I mean, I. I. I'm a. I'm a lover of women. As am I. <laughs> yeah. Which um, sounds horrible the way we just said uh, it. Indeed, doesn't but it? hey. Um, just but like Joe Easterhaus. I uh, love women. I love uh, women. I, lo- yeah, I love them every which way. I well, love that's them the thing. Over the table. Backwards, forwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what's um, interesting is like when I was saying earlier the, the parallels between this and something like Basic Instinct yeah, at certain points. Right. And um, those kind of films are frequently seen as being kind of portraying these shrieking sexist versions of womankind yeah. that could never exist in the real world. Well, and it, when it's been, when that narrative has been concocted by, you know, by Joe Estrahaas and Paul Verhoeven, uh-huh. you know, I can I can almost understand those criticisms <laughs> being leveled because right. of these swaggering demon dogs of cinema or whatever. But Gillian Flynn doing it, I think it's interesting because the Amy that's presented to us in the diaries it's almost like the the eat pray love lady. Yeah, right. It's, right? You know? uh-huh. it's it, betra- it, it, betra- it betrays an awareness and then it undercuts Nobody that. Likes uh-huh. her. Right. Nobody Which believes that. Right. Uh-huh. Is all Which is why well, the whole time I read, want to. I, mean, I agree. Yeah. They want to. Yeah. The whole yeah. time I read Eat right. Pray Love, I just uh-huh. was filled with this sense of dread, like. When's she going to rip her mask when off? She and she rip her mask off yeah. and kill everything. <laughs> Dread and self-loathing. Uh-huh. It's like it's it, it's like it's written to what, make so you feel shit. So what page does she do that on, just so I can uh-huh. jump to it? I don't know. I never actually read that book. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I know. I'm You're just, performing like Amy is. I know. Oh, oh, all of it. Really See, women. Well, yes. All the ladies are taking their masks off, <laughs> folks. I just um, don't. I don't no, think it's sec- fair to to say that. That anyone, especially that women, are only allowed to tell one kind of story about one I, kind of I, woman. I agree. Uh, I think one of the laziest criticisms you can ever op- offer anything is to say, "Oh, this is uh, this Marxist uh-huh. is clearly pr- pr- portraying his his Marxist ideals in this character or this, you know." Uh-huh. If Billie sexist, Jean King feminist. was a feminist for saying that she could play tennis as good as any man, then Gillian Flynn. Is a feminist for saying uh-huh. that Amy can be just as evil and conniving yeah. as any couple. You're not a tennis you know? fan, then, are you? Right. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> you know, and we we read uh, we read to emotionally interface with extreme characters and to yeah. go beyond our boundaries. But I think also um, to fish out survival strategies. At least I do in the books I'm reading. And there are relatable, very very real world things about this book, and yeah. we've, we've touched on this many times during this discussion. The, the stuff about relationships at the beginning is just really true to life. Now, weren't you saying earlier, Mark, that she said in an interview she wrote this book, she was inspired to write this book by her marriage? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I th- that seemed like a funny thing to say yeah, in an interview. Yeah, yeah. But also, right. um, it's, it, there, are, there are details in there that right. are right. very much drawn from. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's, it, and in some ways, like, again... And so special- it's the extremes, but we need to relate to them as well. Yeah. No, so one of the fun things is, is that she can she can draw this carefully uh, nuanced world of two uh. people, and then she can, halfway through the book, rip it apart and say, this is bullshit. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 indeed. Indeed. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I get. All right, so in in the end, do you, do you feel like that's what what has happened here? Uh, when the book winds down, and we're stuck with these, okay. they're stuck. I mean, they yeah. they stuck with each other. Aren't I'm they? so right. glad to leave them. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, me too. It was a fun ride. But I, I, I really <laughs> liked reading it. Uh-huh. I really enjoyed reading. I it. I wasn't wishing uh, any of them to get their comeuppance, uh-huh. which is a difference between this and some of those films we talked I about where the women always dies at the end yeah, or, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or right, wins right, right. or loses or right. there's there is some definite moral judgment right. attached but in this, the best this... i think the best in those femme fatales because that always feels like a moralistic uh you know and almost misogynistic reflex mm-hmm. 
to kill that character, but like in things, in femme fatale things like The Last Seduction or, mm -hmm. you know, narratives she like wins. that. Yes, what you just want to see the bones of all the men who had all these ideals and projections <laughs> and her just rolling off. And, a and then Basic Instinct, she's yeah. very much still there at the well, end. Yeah, except <sighs> she's still with Michael Douglas, which... Uh, she which, loses, which, you're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um uh -huh. I was horrified uh -huh. at the ending. Uh -huh. I very much wanted I wanted her to get caught. Me too. I uh -huh. wanted the police to to see immediately through. But I think they she said she says somewhere in the, around the middle of the book like the bigger the lie, uh -huh. the easier it the is to believe. And she had yeah. strung this amazing trail of bullshit. I don't think there was any way for anyone to pin any one thing down. But that it was the it was the pregnancy. Right. That's what did it for me. The thought, like, you can do whatever you want for the rest of your lives, but the moment that we we discover uh -huh. that she has saved the sperm for, like, four years. <laughs> yeah. Like, four years she has saved the sperm just in case. In case she needs to become and pregnant of course, in he a doesn't time know, and place he where... never cleans out the freezer. Right. Uh -huh. Even though that's the vomit. But, yes, yeah, same, same. But, you know, yeah. the the forethought that she... Uh, in, in case I make my husband so angry that he will no longer put his sperm in me, I better have some on reserve. <laughs> right. It's Mother and child. It's horrifying. Yeah. And, and once that happened, I really wanted her to die. I wanted no, her to die. I, I wanted her... A little her... too close to home? Pregnant, no, Christy? I... Oh! <laughs> You're going to delete that. Um, yeah. No, because... I, because I'm a mother and because I don't want any child in the world to be subjected to these two people. Uh -huh. I know, oh, right? I know. It's, it's horrible. horrible. Yeah. But in that the ending, there's no, like, it, it does imply that it goes on forever. Mm. The ending oh, is. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. His, his idea that he needs to be there to save this child. From is, what he suffered. It's hilarious and, and pathetic and uh -huh. confused. And, and that's when the various people around him who have, Tried to stick by him, his sister and uh -huh. and, uh, and the cop. Right, right. and kind he's of typing his head. story okay. in the middle of the night. He's going to tell his side of <laughs> yeah. the story. Until to what the, end? I mean, right, right. I but know. until the pregnancy, and then yeah. it's you know, You'll be then to me that. it just yeah. becomes. I mean, how how many how many guys how many decent guys? Not that Nick is a decent guy, but how many decent guys do you know that were roped in by a woman? At least three. Right, either mm. by a real or <laughs> fake pregnancy, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> that they have been completely disarmed. Mm -hmm. Right. But yeah, the end. I mean, the the ending is amazing yeah. and frustrating. And well, she has the last word. Yeah. yeah. Well, is... and I think in his particular strain of evil will also get practiced over the course of their relationship. I mean, she she is she is the wire mother, but um. But he'll have his moments, his he, small victories. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be this constant. Because they're battle. playing the same game ultimately. Right. Yeah. She might have gone a lot further with it. Right yeah. There. Yeah. Well, in his like lifetime of evasions of authenticity will find their perfect cradle in this relationship and her lifetime of manipulation and uh and fantasy will uh find the perfect <laughs> canvas in him. <laughs> oh, I know. Can I, can I just say the yes. the copy of the book that I have um had a previous owner. Yes. That I assume was uh, a prisoner because there's a there's really? a prison number. Uh-huh. Personal in the property. Front. There's a stamp yes. on the top. And there's a couple of moments during the book, oh uh, maybe God. two or three moments, yes. where the um, where the owner has written things in the book uh -huh. in pen, like in what? pen, exclamation point. Uh, there's a long passage where, which Holy is quite a nice, okay. pa nice passage where, um, uh, who is talking? Um, Nick is talking about. Uh, we live living in a time where you can't see anything for the first time. Everything right. is experienced secondhand. Yes. People have done everything. This this kind of. Uh, Lost rant almost. Right. Uh, after which, uh, in blue pen, we have the line, Holy fucking amen. Uh, you know, this is a very <laughs> astute prisoner. I want to yeah. know who this is. The person. only other comment in the whole book is uh, during uh, Amy talking about um, Nick being taught a lesson. Um, he glides through life with that charming Nicky grin, his beloved child entitlement, and it goes on. And then uh, the one comment after this is uh, ex wife. Next. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, from a man in prison. What happened? Yes. Yeah, I know. Something grisly, so no doubt. True. I, I right. kind of pictured him as, as the Nick character, having yeah, been murder. suckered. Yeah, the yeah, actual. yeah. Oh. Well, it is refreshing that the to see uh, this woman who's initially painted as the victim. 
Uh-huh. She is she's his Moriarty. She's, uh-huh. <laughs> she is oh, yeah. his Moriarty. Right. Yeah. She's taking control. She's been, she's pulling all the strings. She has laid out this whole plan for years. You, uh-huh. need, you need me to do this. Yeah. Like, uh-huh. yeah, you need me to do this so that you can become the man that you are this meant to be. This shows I care about you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, in, in that passage, which I also, uh, when I read it, th- that he said, um, holy fucking amen to about just the creeping absolute you know like lack of authenticity and that we're copies of copies of performances of Mm -hmm. impressions um yeah that his fascination with that quality in culture is um i mean she's the goddess of of that stuff i mean i think he's really he you know well he he um in so many ways he represents what we all are, which and so he can be completely aware mm-hmm. of 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 bullshit and completely unaware of it, and completely well, addicted and, to it. Yeah. And the yeah. bullshit has consequences. I mean, mm-hmm. the the big consequences of the case, you know, uh-huh. come out only when the uh, talk show host, right. you know, vilifies him, right. and then the other, you know, legitimate news anchor mm-hmm. um, interviews him. That those are like the two big moments. Right. And it's all played out as if on reality TV, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in the media. Right, right. Right, because in a way, I mean, there's this, the huge sort of driving force of the first part of the book is this is this idea that it's always the husband. Mm-hmm. And, and... What can he say once you've said that? Right. And that he's fighting against these perceptions of men that he can't, like... Mm-hmm. And he may be... Almost all the things they say men are, except for except for he didn't do it. Uh huh. <laughs> and how do you fight against that? But time? we make our right. minds up. We see these cases on TV. We make our minds up, and and we we pick our villain, don't we? And, right. And and as so many people point out to him, it, it's almost irrelevant the the real evidence in the case. What's really get, really telling, without the um the body. Mm-hmm. is that people think he did it. Right. A jury will think he did it. A jury will look at his face and think he did it. And that's the most damning thing against him. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that we, the readers of the book, will judge him. Mm-hmm. You know, this is his fate. It's in our hands. Right. Beyond any crime he's ever done. And justice is uh, delivered by viewers of television. Showbiz. Showbiz. Yep. yep. Right. Showbiz and all the, the way down. So the, this movie comes out in the fall. Speaking of showbiz, <clears throat> so yeah, that should be wonderful. Uh, Fincher's great with this sort of thing, but I uh, I love uh, Gillian Flynn's work. Me too. I just want to read more now. Yeah, indeed. Well, so I really enjoyed it. Yeah, not me. I mean, despite the <laughs> right. all the stuff we're talking about that may be bugged or whatever, uh-huh. I really, really, really liked reading this one. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, and I wonder. I mean, I'm, I'm again. I'm not. I haven't read her previous book, so I'm not sure. You know, like where this is on her evolutionary arc as an artiste. But I'd like to see, you know, more of the nuanced literary domesticity. You know, like mm-hmm. the courage to kind of see that through to its conclusion without necessarily exploding into the pulp, twisty, turny, you know, hyperbolic yeah. roller coaster ride. Yeah, the, the, the nuanced nope. literary domesticity was the part, oh, Yeah, God. yeah, gut-wrenching and right? harrowing. Yeah. Right, um, And it was, yes, and then it kicked into this gear of fun that I wasn't expecting. But and that I appreciated. <laughs> yeah, so. engaging till the end. But yeah. let's uh, let's stay in that clammy bedroom and uh, stuff. Stuff those sociopaths in the uh, in the shadows of um, of our broken human souls. We have I, to I we have to stop them. Um, we, we have to bear witness to the stuffing between them. Okay, I don't want to read any okay. more Jillian Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm reading a very nice young adult paranormal <laughs> romance right now. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. I, um, calming you. I, I like my my domesticity unliterary, <laughs> and I like my villains thoroughly punished by the end of the book. Mm-hmm. This made me uncomfortable. Right. Oh, sweetie. I'm sorry. Well, I like the heroes I lo- and villains. I loved it. Punished from start to finish. I loved it, yeah. but... <laughs> uh-huh, right, yeah. I'm glad that I'm out of it. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, we did our time inside Gone Girl, and... Uh, uh, by the way, the title, Gone Girl? Yeah. No, I think that called back to... Amy, there's a... Se- like, Amy is going through a series of parts, which she says explicitly, I'm I'm playing cool girl. I'm playing oh, comedy girl, and then she's I'm saying, now I'm Gone playing girl. Gone Girl. Yeah, and everybody loves Gone Girl. Yeah. Never mind. I'm mm. over it. Um, 
Yes. All right. We're all over it now, and we're moving on. And uh, I think uh, next on the um, on the dance card will be Authority. Authority. Yeah, by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, and uh, and so we're we're gonna we're gonna keep rolling, exploring the world of books, and keeping reading alive like we do on Book Circle Online. And we're glad that you're tuning in and bearing witness to our angelic autopsies of these uh, these beautiful works of art. And uh, if you, uh, however you are receiving these transfusions from the book circle dimension, um, try us out on iTunes. And I love iTunes. iTunes is fantastic as a service, as a corporation, as a concept. There's just something beautiful about the iTunes idea. And um, that's another beautiful idea. But... Uh, if you go on iTunes, then uh, you know, and leave some comments, rate us, tell us what you think, and we'd all we'll get together on Moss. We'll have little group, almost like Reddit, you know, press conferences, except a little more, you know, low tech and you know, Literary. smear. Yeah, if you will, <laughs> and uh, we'll answer your comments and you know, tell us how we can improve you know these uh these podcasts uh tell us uh throw some some book ideas at us that oh, you'd yeah. like us to explore um but uh i am jason squamata and it is my delight to have been here with you in the libraries of maria menounos in the bowels of the uh, after buzz tv satellite mm -hmm. headquarters Beep. here Beep. in Beep. the glory that is Beep. book circle online with my co-hosts pat janowski mark savage Christy Lovato. And once again, Jason Squamata. Thank you so much for tuning in. Keep it bookish. Keep it circular. Keep reading alive. And uh, everything you need resides in the ink. And it's waiting. And for God's sake, be nice to your wives. Okay. And your husbands. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menounos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle. Constantly fantasizing about his wife's head and her crawling across the floor. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know if this is a memory. As we right. learn more about the dynamics of their relationship, right. it becomes, you know, um, not more obvious, uh, but, you know, more possible that this is just a, a fantasy that he nourishes to get uh -huh. through the day. Uh -huh. Sort of nourishes. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's beautifully drawn in that, I, I agree with you, Christy, I, I hated that first half. I was, it made me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in long-term relationships before, and um, I know that shocks you. And What's that like? I'll never say. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it like this? Was it just like this? Because this is how I imagine it would uh -huh. be. Here's the thing. There were some very typical relationship issues uh -huh. that were addressed very true to life -ly. Mm. Um, except for with a missing and or dead wife. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like if he killed his wife, this is all horrible. If something else happened, it's horrible still. If it, it's just, there's some really ugly descriptions of, um, very, very specific descriptions of the ugly feelings and the mm -hmm. ugly ways people can react to them and the things that can happen in a relationship, despite what, may appear to be everybody's best efforts. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we have an unreliable narrator or two makes this all suspect. But still, mm -hmm. I felt at one point <laughs> I asked my partner, what is your blood type? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to know? Because I didn't know. <laughs> if it know. comes up in a police and, investigation. And it, because it came up <laughs> right. in a police and Nick investigation. Doesn't and know. he doesn't know. And, and the police officer says, you don't know. Yeah. And I'm like to myself, oh, am I supposed to know? Right. I don't know. Is that a sign of guilt that uh -huh. he doesn't know? Right? But then <laughs> I asked, and yeah. my partner did not know his own blood type. I don't oh. even know my blood type, so maybe I killed me. You don't? Me. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> killed me. Call the police. Well, That's I'm glad you said not, unreliable uh -huh. narrator or two, because Amy's diary is so oh. uh, wrong. Oh. And... 
Right. Okay, what I, well, what I what I love about it, it's I mean, in contrast to the kind of creeping evil of Nick's perspective, mm-hmm. where you know, I mean, I, I just I love how that sort of first chapter we're buying him is that he's clearly like kind of emotionally inert and has a very curious detachment from from what's happening or what's coming to light, but. You know, we're still, you know, I'm still buying him as a, as a normal, quote unquote, normal person. But then when it gets to the end of that chapter and he says, and that was the fifth lie I told the police. Yeah. Right. And you're just right. like, oh, God, you uh-huh. want to go back and look, but you don't want to go back and look because it's so distasteful. Yeah. yeah. And, and he's so evasive even in terms of his own internal dialogue that it almost keeps like, like it, it convincingly cuts away from, you know, like right on the brink of revelation, even mm-hmm. if he's just talking to himself. Well, you don't know if he's hiding things from himself. Right. Right. Even yeah. Whereas in similarly in her diary, I mean, it cuts to this kind of like romantic Pollyanna, you know, version of an earlier stage in the relationship. They started out. So they started out in New York. Right. Uh, literary type people. She is the daughter of these two. We come to find out crazy people, but they're, uh, they are, appear to be or Mr. Are Mrs. They? Or, are or are they? they? Well, yeah. Well, well, because her testimony has it that they're crazy. Do we believe her testimony? Less and less. Well, I believed Mm. that her mom had all those miscarriages. Yeah, sure. And that they were all Does that make you crazy? Uh Okay, so maybe not crazy, but I've known people... Wait, since my life is starting to sound really (laughs) suspect right now. (laughs) Are you dead right now? (laughs) You'll never know. I've known people who, when they um, suffer from severe uh, infertility really seem to go off the deep end. And I'm not criticizing these people, and I've been through a little bit of that, but not to the extent that her mother uh, allegedly was in this book. But I can totally picture that happening, and I sympathize with it. However, I can also see how that sort of family circumstance might really fuck up this kid. Well, well and it goes... Go oh, on. no, go ahead. So, it go- I mean, it goes deeper than that. I mean, because... So so Amy's mother suffers a series of miscarriages, seven miscarriages, and she is the eighth pregnancy and she lives. And her ent- their entire life, r- their livelihood, they write children's books based on her as a character, their entire life. Amazing Amy. Amazing Amy um, revolves around her. So you see but not how her, right? but a construct of... Well, how they want her to be. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Like and whenever she, she makes a decision they don't approve of, the fictional version of her enshrined in these books um, makes the opposite decision. Oh, it's so horrible. <laughs> so passive aggressive. And that's what I mean by crazy people. <laughs> right. It's like you, honey, you be however you want to be. But our perfect aim. When I think of my wife, I always think of her head, the shape of it to begin with. The very first time I saw her, it was the back of the head I saw. And there was something lovely about it, the angles of it, like a shiny, hard corn kernel or a riverbed fossil. She had what the Victorians would call a finely shaped head. You could imagine the skull quite easily. I'd know her head anywhere. That is the opening passage of Gone Girl, a book by Gillian Flynn, a riveting thriller uh, that uh, comes at a terrible crime style event from two very different but weirdly complementary angles uh i'm jason squamata this is book circle online and uh this is the gone girl edition from the library of maria menounos this is book circle online featuring in-depth discussion insight news and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors and now book circle online Okay, so here we are. Uh, I'm Jason Scumato. Welcome to Book Circle. I am here, as always, with my ravishing co-hosts. Pat Janowski. Mark Savage. Christy Lovato. And, uh, and we are here covering a marvelous, ripping thriller of a book that I just love to pieces. Soon uh, to be made into a major motion picture. Soon to be made into a major, m- a major motion picture, but um, a, a, uh, an adventure of the senses in its own right, even in its book form, Absolutely. entitled Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. Um, uh, I loved it. 
what are some general thoughts that we all might have on this book? Pat? This was a diverting mystery. It, little things about it cropped up to annoy me from time to time. We'll get into those later. Mm-hmm. However, once I hit the halfway point of this book, I could not put it down. Mm. I stayed up till 3 in the morning reading this book. Um, or was that the last book I read? Uh, it was... <laughs> let me start that again. Uh-huh. Was it? I can't remember. <laughs> well, no, I, I remember when we spoke of this book as you were in the process of reading it. I that said was, that. So yeah. I stayed up in the, until 3 in the morning, two nights in a row, to finish this book because I was just completely riveted. Um, that's where I'll start. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Mark? Yeah, I enjoyed it. I feel kind of see me hmm. i feel the do you feel dirty it's kind of a suburban see me not a glamorous uh-huh, see, a kind right. of desperate um um kind of stuck in a in a in a relationship with someone who isn't the person you thought they were mm. see me that kind of right you can't have enough showers to wash that away so yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. but you. I mean, we could consider that a a measured and considered aesthetic effect. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah for real. Um, interesting, Christy. Um, I did not like this book. I loved this book, but I did not like it. It was like a really pretty place that I just wanted to get out of as quickly as possible. And actually. I want to wrap this up as quick as we can so I can go check my husband's cell phone messages. <laughs> um, Which cell phone? All of them. Uh-huh. Oh, uh-huh. All of them. All of them. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, it was – these were two of the most horrible people that I've ever met. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you're the husband and the wife. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So Nick and Amy. Right. Nick and Amy. Yeah. So this, uh, this book is, um, I mean, ostensibly, initially about uh, this, this couple – this uh, charming, um, but I think from the get-go, kind of creepy couple, um, Nick and Amy. Amy has disappeared from their lovely suburban Missouri home. Under mysterious circumstances. Under mysterious circumstances. And we are clued into this. Uh, it, it opens with Nick's narration, which begins on the day of her disappearance. And, uh, and I think in kind of an ingenious way... Um, She's framing his experience so that, I mean, we, we go a ways into his story without really knowing how involved he is in her disappearance. Mm-hmm. And uh, Yeah, he sort of narrates it dispassionately and does not appear to have knowledge of what went on. Right, right. And, uh, and then when it cuts, the, you know, the, the chapters are interspersed between Nick in present time and um, and Amy's diary, his lovely wife and her sweet <laughs> diary, were recounting the the moments of their relationship leading up to whatever terrible thing happened. Mm-hmm. And in both of those narratives, you can tell that there's something seriously wrong with each of them. Uh-huh. He is off kilter in some way and guilty of something, and it does not help that he is calm. Me would do this. Our Which has nothing to do with you. Right, yeah. Right, <laughs> right. I love how uh-huh. when we get beyond diary Amy to, to actual Amy, crazy bitch Amy, uh-huh. I love that description of her seven, her seven angel sisters who never had a chance to get anything wrong and how can she live up to that? Uh- <laughs> how can she live up <laughs> to her mother's of the miscarried miscarriages. children? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and, but even before it gets to that point, I think there's this interesting dynamic. As we learn... That these diaries, with her rhapsodic romantic vision of her relationship with Nick, are written for a very specific purpose. Mm-hmm. And right. so they're almost, they're written to the police, yep. and in a way written to Nick. And there's this amazing, as you're reading them, you're feeling this growing sympathy for her as it becomes mm-hmm. a- apparent that something terrible has happened. But also, I'm hearing Nick's voice in my head, like imagining him reading them. And finding her like infuriatingly stupid for um, for for her inability to uh, to to see how how menacing he is, like and he, that turns out not to be the actual the actual Nick. But there was a stage. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Like there was like I was when I you was, weren't sure whether he murdered her or not. Yeah, <laughs> and I was identifying with um, her <laughs> idealism and the tragedy of her hopes that would be so violently thwarted, and also 
um, I was identifying with his rage that would make such a thing, you know, happen. Like, I, like two people who are just so obviously estranged from each other and projecting things on each other. Yeah. In a way, I saw a parallel between Amy's diary and her parents' amazing Amy books. Yeah. Because there was oh, definitely oh, like a, yeah. like everything that Nick did uh-huh. in diaries that a normal woman would be like, we need to talk. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's like, I'm not going to be one of those girls who gets mad at her husband right. because he doesn't meet her at the bar when he says he's going to. Uh-uh. Those silly monkeys. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I-, I can't believe that any police officer would have fallen for that. Well, but a police officer is in as she like kind of indicts the, the male of the species like later on when she's describing her um, her strategy that. uh it's um, she's she's pretending to be a very uh, particular type of girl, this cool girl that um, that in her view every man is hungering for. So even the right. police and which, reading these diaries, how could you hurt this poor perfect woman? Who's who's <laughs> this <laughs> complete cool girl? <laughs> right, she's nothing like my wife. How uh, could yeah. you have done? <laughs> she gave you everything. <laughs> right, and nobody nobody recognizes that, uh-huh. that 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 cool girl is a fiction. Right, that. Does every man want that, really? Uh-huh. She has such hostility towards men in general, and him in particular, right. that uh, you mistrust that whole idea. Yeah, well, you feel like she assesses him accurately, like the way he throws himself into the affair, the Andy relationship, this unchallenging right. mm-hmm. sort of, you know, girl who's... Actual much more, cool girl. An actual, well, or someone who's like much more, with more authenticity and vim yeah. and vigor performing, you know, the cool girl, because that's what you do without this kind of, you know, yammering sociopath behind her eyes, you know, like right. mm-hmm. reinforcing the mask. But, uh, you know, like... But if Amy's vision of the um, like the archetypal male is Nick, um, and uh, and presumably Nick's version of the archetypal desirable female is the cool girl, then they're both they're both insane. Right, right, and that's a lot. Yeah. Of, to me, a lot of the story was like two sociopaths <laughs> fall in love, right, and they accidentally meet at that moment where they're both being the golden boy and the mm-hmm. golden girl, right. where you rein in your victim. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. and is, it turns out they're both sociopaths, and it um, turns out they're both right, and it ends that way. Which yeah, is but so they are. But that's what's interesting is her her critique of his behavior is completely. It's true. Yeah, and uh, and yet, I mean. He he is completely flawed, but not in ways which are um, completely unacceptable. Well, you know? and the, and the thing is, her critique of his behavior is true. However, we don't know at this point that she is a sociopath, and that she has put on the persona with which she has attracted him mm-hmm. um, deliberately and held it up for a couple years, and then changed. After they got married. And so he's frustrated. He's like, who is this person? You're not the person I married. Right. And she literally is not because she was pretending. Right. But in her view, he did the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. And and he and he did do the same thing right. because with, with he, less he said deliberate exactly. effort. He, you know, he said, I would spend two hours crafting an email to her. We all right. do those things. Yeah. At the beginning. But we don't do what Amy does. Right. right. And, and so I think he's a little less detestable and, or crazy than she is well what I, makes it hard with her is when you realize the extent of her lies mm-hmm. when you realize the extent of her performance and how long she's been planning things it becomes impossible to believe anything she's telling us right right um which, well, which we all have to a trope and in a weird way completely yeah. and he finds himself having you know the the the, the realistic thing to do in that situation is to be completely confused by the cameras and right. to kind of stand there looking blank. Right, right. But, but what, what is seen as a, so, a sign of um, innocence is yeah. to perform, right. to perform, to, to have tears, to yeah. actually go out there and be the great TV personality, right, right, which right. he can't find himself doing. Yeah. Um, and well, that's where um, I found him most sympathetic. Oh, yeah, and, and fascinating, because when he talks about having, like, you know, he's this working-class guy, but he's got this old money face that you just want to punch as soon yeah. as you see him. Hi, he's, hi. He's, he's a young and, Robert Redford. And yeah. his name is really Lance, not Nick. Right, yeah, and yeah, right. yeah, but he could never, no one can know that's that. Not he's not Nicky. And you can tell when the, when the public narrative starts to turn against him when they start calling <laughs> him Lance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And the detail. three, La- Lance, Nicholas, right. Yeah. right. The three names, the serial but, killer. But, and so having this reflex right, right, where right. if anyone sees his face at rest they're going to take an instant disliking to him so being up there 
in the lights with Amy's parents, like crying copious tears, and he's nervous. So he had, his reflex is the ingratiating smile. smile. No one with this goofy <laughs> smile could ever be like a preppy schmuck that's going to hurt you. But Why would you? But, it makes but him look in like that a context, shark. yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> their re- their uh-huh. reveals are like uh-huh. inverted. So you, you right. start out with Nick being threatening and potentially evil, and it turns yeah. out he's he really is just kind of a schmuck. He, he's a he's an He's an accidental misogynist. He has his father's like, uh, fucking bitch, fucking bitch, bitch fucking yeah. bitch going through his head all the time. Even well, though he really wants to rebel against that and not be that. But yeah. all the women around him are manipulative bitches. Yeah. Shauna. That right. woman. Is that the name of the woman with the selfie? That mm-hmm. like yeah. went, oh yeah, my yeah. God. But right. he knows it as well. And, and uh, yet he walks into the trap. Yeah. Well, Shauna he doesn't and have then, the well, power to say, leave me alone. Well, yeah. I mean, I think he. I, he Which I is think, kind of a feminine thing. It's like women aren't aren't allowed to say to someone, I'm not interested. Right. You know, so you have to say, I have a boyfriend. Right, yeah, yeah. Only until they are confronted with the fact that there might be another male right. will they leave you alone. Mm-hmm. Right. I um, mean, you just can't say, hey, but I'm also, not interested. But also, I think, I think there's a point when, when, where he, as a man, does not have experience of saying no to women. Uh-huh. He doesn't do it. Mm-hmm. As we've seen, he has affairs. He doesn't say no. But also, on, a, on another level, women don't approach men in quite the way that, um, men approach women, perhaps. So he's used to being the yes man. He he gets what he wants because he he approaches women and says, "I want you," and they they want him right. because he's attractive. And well, he's and I, the I, baby boy. Well, yeah, but I think also like assuming, okay, I look like this, and I said the right thing that the character who's playing me would say in this situation. So I got this. So I guess I want this. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like there's, like, in the same way that there's this kind of, like, shrieking mania in her that mm-hmm. she masks mm-hmm. with these layers of performance, there's just this this emptiness. I mean, Well, it, not necessarily empty, but really, really buried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like because what, he what does, does feel he things. He does right. feel things, but he does, they're not close to the surface. Right. Um, yeah, mo- it mostly comes out as this, like, He's just exasperated with the whole situation. Like, yeah. this can't be happening to uh, me. This uh, is crazy. Wait, right, really? <laughs> this is like a movie. Uh-huh. What yeah. the hell? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. And I and I think that the constant, this, you know, like what, you know, this is like a movie. What role am I supposed to be playing? What narrative do the police have? And do I play to that or against that? Like all those questions of what kind of story am I in and how should I be behaving seem to indicate just... Like someone like I, I've I've read interviews with the author where she and the thing that really made me want to read this book was her espousing her her uh, she's a student of Patricia Highsmith and she uh-huh. loves Patricia Highsmith. Oh, yeah, yeah. me too. I'm yeah, a big fan. That. Yeah. And so in, um, you know, in, in the Ripley books, <clears throat> you get this portrait of a sociopath whose relationships are very fleeting and opportunistic. We mm-hmm. don't really get to see. I mean, Ripley is married, at, I think, a couple of points in those books, but we don't get to see Ripley in a relationship per se. And for the first half of the book, before the reveal, and he became more definitively the victim, there's a similar nobody home. There's this similar, oh, like... Oh, so Nick oh, might be Ripley. Yeah. But you might, by the end, think that actually... Yeah, that Amy is more Ripley. the Ripley character. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, right. And well, so, post-reveal. Yes. Post the black first black page right uh-huh. where we we get to see the true internal dialogue of amy not the diary amy uh-huh. yeah i can't wait um, till they find my diary i really started uh-huh. to enjoy that <laughs> that tr- transition for me was um so amy has chopped off her hair she gives herself a mousy haircut she has slowly been putting on you know she's gained 15 pounds she has essentially disarmed all of the qualities that made it easy for her to manipulate people and she has put herself in this world the hideaway the hideaway hotel mm-hmm. in the in the catskills in the, the ozark adirondack ozarks, Adir- ozarks. Mm-hmm. is where i i had problems with the second half of the book because up until a certain point it feels like a conflict two people who you have some sympathy for perhaps in different ways, struggling to try and make something work that isn't perfect, but retain some idea that it is, right. uh, it gets to the point where you realize that's not what she's doing at all. She's doing something far bigger, far more sinister, far more... Hyperbolic and yeah. crime fiction. And yeah. then you can't believe anything she says. Yeah. At which point, um, <clears throat> the hard thing with 
unreliable narrators is you get to the point where you think, well, why should I care what you're saying to me? Right, because if it's just going to get flipped in the Yeah, and everything chapter. you say yeah. is random, and I don't know. And right. you're, you're capable of far more sinister things than I even thought. Right, right. Well, that I, I had a similar, I mean, I you know, I, I loved it to the end. Um, you know, it, it accrued like a different kind of entertainment value than what I was anticipating. Yeah, but there was there was a quality to the first half of it that I, I missed when it went away. There mm-hmm. was a spookiness because yeah. Yeah. it was about we were getting more and more intimate with these deranged characters. Well, and, and he was falling back in love with her. Yeah, yeah, and we were her her horrible plot, whatever, was uh, working. Right. He, yeah. He, but you realize. I can't trust the Amy of that half of the book. So right. then can I trust this this carefully nuanced observation yeah. of a relationship? At what point is any of this true? Well, and then it became this kind of this game of like sting after sting after yeah. sting. Yeah. Like I feel like the second half relied on kind of like cr- crime fiction mm-hmm. like plot mechanics yeah. in a way that the first, the first half... Well, I, I mean, in the first half, I was thinking about their relationship. In the second half, I was thinking about... Uh, a certain kind of movie, uh-huh. um, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, uh-huh. a single white female, basic right. instinct, right. that kind of sure. ru- ru- kind of wave of, of films <laughs> in which uh, 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 women do incredibly um, violent things. Right, and at the same time are kind of presented in the text at, like as woman, that there's somehow like vampire monster woman. Woman. I mean, I, you know, I, I felt like she felt very real to me. Up until, I mean, I loved the reveal of, yo, I'm not dead. And, yeah, you know, me too. And, uh, and, you know, you get a rush from that like you do from any, like, really carefully plotted, like, twist. twist. But uh, there was something that was lost. Was anyone surprised point. by her not being dead? No. Oh. I wasn't surprised by her not being dead. Um, I, you know, really, the the moment the the first half ended when he's walking up to the to the shed, in my mind, I had tried and tried to kind of bend it into the shape where, okay, his dad, who's mentioned only sporadically and mm-hmm. who's crazy but keeps escaping and has emotional issues and um, killed her. Mm. While he was cleaning up the blood, she crawled away, and she's in the shed. Her dead body's in the shed. Mm. That's where I had – I was like, oh, that's what's there. Right. I was glad it wasn't uh-huh. because it's like the book ended halfway through. Uh-huh, I knew right, that yeah, wasn't going to happen because right. of the size of the book. Yes. Um, but um, when it goes into that different set, different sort of construct, this this female villain movie, this mm-hmm. for me it's kind of the classic murder mystery type of thing that, mm-hmm. s- that happened in the second half. And I like that. That's what I was yeah. saying. It was diverting. Sure. The first half was super uncomfortable for me. It felt close to home. It felt like, oh, yeah. this is a relationship. This is written by somebody who's been in a relationship right. and who understands how things die, how, th- how hard it is. how, And it was just uh. – <coughs> and then the second half was kind of like, ooh. What's going to happen? Right. Next? Yeah. And however, there are disadvantages to that. Like when he, the unreliable narrative thing, when he decided not to love Andy anymore uh-huh. on the airplane ride. Okay. I don't love her. Right. And that just like, poof, she was out of his life. If, if he can turn off his feelings so quickly, yeah. it really undermines our investment yeah. in his story. Right. You know, in well, his. Well, you know, I actually, um, something with her, like the big reveal with her is this, you know, scheming villain and still being alive. Something else that was lost that I liked about him was like the possibility of his supreme evil. Yeah. Like I didn't, mm-hmm. I, I like, I like missed the dread in his sections where like in those first few chapters with him, he's like, I love that where he's first being interrogated by the police and one of the policemen spins the chair around in the interrogation <laughs> room and sits down in it. And he's wondering, is that something that cops have always done? Or did they see it in a cop do that in a movie and decided it was cool and they've done it ever since? Yeah. Right. And, and he's like, is this... A, and okay, if so, how am I supposed and to... How am so I much, right, so yeah. much of his detachment, uh-huh. which is seen as a sign of guilt, yeah. is is almost this, this postmodernist uh, awareness he has. Right. Of having seen these movies where the husband is suspected. Right. Which we all have too. Yeah.